Hi and welcome to the Pool Guy Podcast Show. In this podcast, I'm going to be joined by Rudy Stankiewicz and we're going to go over his new book, How to Get Rid and Prevent Swimming Pool Algae. It's definitely probably the ultimate guide on swimming pool and algae and how to, of course, prevent it and get rid of the algae that's in the pool. And Rudy's going to go over in detail some of the aspects of his book. And so if you're a pool service professional and you're dealing with pools with algae, like who's not dealing with pools with algae, but definitely this is a podcast for you if you are in the swimming pool industry and you service pools. Pool Service Pro, open a Leslie's Wholesale account today and receive wholesale pricing on products you use every day. Leslie's Pool Supply offers convenient locations that are open seven days a week. Another great benefit of opening a Leslie's Wholesale account is Leslie's Referral Program. Get referred to a customer looking for weekly pool service. Also receive priority service, enhanced rebate programs, a discount on your general liability insurance through SPA, a discount on your pool riding software through Skimmer, and an opportunity to co-brand with Leslie's on your social media, website, truck, and more. Save time and money and grow your pool service route and become a Leslie's Leslie's Pro. So I'm joined today by Rudy Stinkowitz, and he is he does a lot of things, first of all. And I'll, I'll probably let him introduce himself because he has so many things that he does, and I don't want to miss anything. <laughs> so how are you doing today, Rudy? I'm doing okay. I'm doing great. Thank you for having me, David. I, 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 always, enjoy, I always enjoy chatting with you on your show and getting to talk to the folks um, that listen to it. So doing well. Yeah, so why don't you go over your background for the listeners so they kind of, kind of know your background in the industry? Well, I've been in the industry. This actually April 18th will be 30 years to the date. So that'll be 30 years for me in the pool industry. So good long while. Uh, Like most people, I didn't intend on a career in the swimming pool industry. It just kind of happened. I ETS from the service and needed a job and did not know how to transition any of the skills that I'd picked up while I was in the uh, military and I went a good while. Um, and of course I was young, so I was answering questions like you would answer questions when you're young, you know, for, and just normal interview questions, David, like for example, you know, you always get the one, tell me about something that, tell me about the most stressful thing you went through in your last career. Well, I just came out of the infantry, so, <laughs> and a lot of times they'd sit there you know, with their jaw gaping, it wasn't what they were really looking for. And of course, I didn't know how to really spin it to give them what they were looking for either. But after a little bit, I I saw an ad for an assistant manager at a pool store. And I said, well, you know, I can do that. So I went over there to check it out and filled out the application. And they hired me and I swore up and down, I would keep looking. The pools were not going to be the life for me. Um, I ended up being with that company, that store for uh, 10 years. And then uh, from there, I went and worked for a couple of different manufacturers. After that, I decided to open my own swimming pool service company here in North Central Florida, which I operated for close to 10 years. Um, Then I had some mobility issues. I know you're aware of those, which kind of it, it's hard to service pools when you can't walk. So <laughs> we had to uh, take a step back and come up with a new plan. So I sold that company, uh, the whole company, route, trucks, equipment, um, and my, you know, on the condition that my techs, you know, maintained a job as well. And I, I did okay with that. But, you know, I'm not ready to retire. I'm still kind of young. We'll go with kind of young. Um, so I had to figure out something to do. So I decided that I would try teaching and consulting and use that as a way to give back a little bit. The pool industry, even though I didn't want to be in it, was very, very good to me. So I wanted to be able to contribute and, you know, teaching, teaching does that helps to, you know, not necessarily, um, I don't believe anybody should ever have to reinvent the wheel. I think it's better if we pass the torch. We've been through that. We've, you know, we've gotten as far as we can. If the next folks that come along can go even further because of our help, our, you know, mentoring or, or what have you, and that's what we should do. So anyway, that's how I ended up here. Um, as you mentioned, uh, I do a bunch of different things. I have a column in Pool Pro Magazine uh, that I write. I uh, 
do the CPO classes. I teach AFO classes as well. I have a couple of my own classes that I teach. I'm also a published author. I have, uh, I have a psychological thriller. I have a series of children's books. And then I have a book on uh, the latest on the how to get rid of swimming pool algae. So that's that's the gamut there. And, uh, you know, outside of that, I like to travel. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, the reason the reason why we're we're here today is for that book, the How to Get Rid and Prevent Swimming Pool Algae. It's the original title there. You know, you yes, can't, can't mistake that for anything else. No, <laughs> uh, I wanted to call it what it is. Yeah, so it is uh, <laughs> definitely um, it definitely tells you what it is. Yeah, and you know, I read the whole book through, and you start off the book, I think, in the right place, and that is ways for the service pro to actually prevent the algae and you know some of the things you mentioned are very basic in the book and you go over some of the chemistry but let's start with the first point and this one here i don't think a lot of guys are going to like this but your first point is <laughs> brushing every pool every time you visit the stop well not necessarily well not necessarily every time you know I'd rather it's done every time because it's easier to make it part of your routine that way. Honestly, yeah. I mean, and we're talking about with a once a week visit, if you're brushing it every other week, that's probably great, but it doesn't really lend toward becoming a routine. Brushing it every time you're out there does that, that becomes more of a habit. It's easier to keep with that. And yeah, I, I don't know if a lot of folks like that or not. I know when I was out there, I did a brush every single time, and uh, it does keep you in good shape, for sure. Uh, but it's so important. It's one of the easiest things you can do to prevent algae. You got to keep in mind, algae is microscopic, and you don't see it until there is a ton of it in the pool. Seriously. So we could almost assume that it's almost always there to one extent or another. And what we're actually doing is controlling it. We're keeping it from getting to that point where it's visible. Hopefully we get it to the point where there's none, but there's probably always some there to some extent. So by brushing the walls, most a lot of different types of algae adhere to walls, right? They have that schmear adhesion thing going on. By brushing the walls, you're dislodging a lot of that algae. It's kind of like if you had a plant in your yard and you tore it out by the roots and then planted it somewhere else. Chances are that plant's going to die just from the shock of being ripped out of the ground. Mm -hmm. You're also now giving chemicals a 360 degree radius in which they can attack that cell, where when it's adhered to the wall, it only has really the one side to focus on. Then the potential for it to be filtered out. So that's that's super important and if we look at things along the lines of black algae we know chlorine cannot penetrate this i'm going to call it the slime the slime layer of black algae chlorine works on the surface it does peel off layers but it works on the surface it can't actually penetrate the slime to get through to the cell so brushing when we are trying to prevent algae works especially well with preventing black algae because it does help to remove that slime layer so the chlorine in the water can actually get to the bacteria which makes up that biofilm which is what black algae actually is. Yeah, so I think you know the idea behind the book of writing a book specifically on algae I mean, it's a great idea. I wish I would have thought of it Thank myself. You. <laughs> you have a book. I've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> so. um, but I think a book specifically on one of the biggest plagues of the pool industry, because I think this is one of the biggest problems people run into, is the algae thing. This is probably the most calls you get from customers. They see algae is very visible, and they'll call you and complain. And I think most accounts are lost because of this problem, the algae problem. Customers don't put up with it. They don't like it. Um, and so you mentioned in the book something that I found interesting that I didn't think about, and that's looking at sur the surrounding around the pool and how that can contribute to the algae itself. You want to go over that for the listeners? Well, sure. Uh, well, let me address the first part of that statement first. I wrote the book specifically on the prevention of algae because a book on the prevention of algae doesn't exist or didn't exist. It does now. But if you look at all of the different books that are available for pool care, you have complete pool care, you have complete pool maintenance, you have things along those lines that cover everything from A to Z. And they do touch upon algae prevention, 
right, and how to get rid of algae, but it's brief. And that's fine. Those books are fantastic, and they accomplish what they're supposed to accomplish. But I wanted something that just focused, like you said, on the major, we'll call it a plague, <laughs> that we deal with, um, and really gets that point across, because there's so much more to it than we normally see. So that's why I wanted a book specifically on that topic. Now, as far as taking the environment and things around the pool into account, we have to consider that a swimming pool is open to everything, right? It's not sealed off. It's out in your backyard or somebody's backyard or at a facility. There's no cover. Anything that happens in that area is going to affect that pool. So it's kind of makes perfect sense that when you go to this pool that you take a look at all of these things. So for years in talking to students, I would always tell them, you know, remember back in the 90s, we had this expression, we would say, you need to think outside the box, mm -hmm. right? Everything was think outside the box. You couldn't see a help wanted ad that didn't say we want out of the box thinkers. You couldn't interview somebody, David, why should I hire you? Well, I think outside the box. <laughs> that was the response you'd get. So isn't a swimming pool really just a box filled with water? So that's all I'm asking for is the same thing. I want to think outside the box. I want to think outside the pool. I want to look up. I want to look left. I want to look right. I want to look at everything that's around in that area that can affect this pool. And it lends more toward um, treating the pool as an individual, understanding that, yes, a pool is a pool, but they're kind of like a fingerprint. Right. Everybody has one, but they're all unique and it's unique to those yard conditions. It's unique to the people that own it, to the pets. Um, so we do really have to look at all of those factors in the area. And I know uh, one of the things we spoke about was proximity to a natural body of water. Right. Mm -hmm. So if we have a pond or a lake or something along those lines nearby, one of the things we have to consider is how algae gets to the swimming pool. Right. So if you're close to a natural body of water, what happens, algae spores are airborne. And the way they get into the air is when something splashes, a fish jumps, a branch falls. If it's a big enough lake or it's windy enough, when waves crash to the shore, all of that sends algae spores into the air. Heavy rain can do it. Even fog can pull it through an electrostatic mist. It can actually pull these spores along. But the pools that are closer, think of the concentration moving through the air. And as it's moving through the air, there's fallout, there's fallout, there's fallout as it chugs along. Those pools that are right next to that natural body of water, they're getting the greatest concentration of spores compared to one that's further away. So that pool needs to be more of a focus. There, there's more preventative measures that need to be in place for that pool than one that we have that's further away from that body of water. Does this make sense? Yeah, total sense. Okay. And you mentioned also something in even closer proximity, like a screened-in pool in Florida, which you know we're jealous of you guys down there with those pools that are screened in. But oh. You definitely said they're contributing to algae, too, in some cases. They can. They they definitely can. Uh, I wouldn't be jealous. They they definitely come with their own problems. They're fantastic for keeping leaves out of the pool. They do a great job at keeping insects, you know, like mosquitoes and such, off of the folks that are hanging out on the back patios and such. But they don't keep animals out. Snakes are constantly still in the pools. If a gator wants to come through the screen, the gator comes through the screen. That's just how it is. These are big, heavy animals that are just plowing forward. Uh, so there's not a benefit there. But screens eventually get to the point where they need to be cleaned. And if you have screen windows at your home, you see the same thing. You have to periodically clean those. If this is not being done, it holds debris. You can see they get that green tint to them. So it holds all these different organics. And up on the top, you can get leaf debris, you can get pine needles, you can get things all along those lines that just set there if they're not being cleaned on a regular basis. And it sounds like it would be a simple enough thing to do, but the reality of it is, is that folks aren't really good about that. So we remind them and we remind them and we tell them that it needs to be done. But it's no secret that we don't get as much rain over the winter months as we do as in the summer. So all of that stuff over the winter dries and dries 
and dehydrates. And then we get to March and we get that first blast of rain, those torrential downpours that you can see in Florida. It's almost like end of the world rain with the skies turning black. And it saturates all of that stuff. So what do you think happens after it gets saturated? It starts to drip. And what it's adding to the water, and this depends a lot on the type of debris, but it's adding phosphates, it's adding nitrates, it's adding organics to the water, which can very easily turn a pool from clear to swamp green in a short time. And if we're not prepared for that, if the chlorine levels on the low side and we're not um, ready for this torrential downpour, it can happen even quicker. So that's one of the things that, uh, you know, it's, it comes down to communication. You have to talk to the homeowners when you see something that's beyond your control. And I talk a lot in the book about things you can do, right? But our pond scenario or a screen enclosure or other things that you see on the property, if there's things that are beyond your control, you need to put that ball in someone else's lap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have the same problem in California because we have a lot of trees hanging over the pools and I constantly am on the customers about trimming back the trees, oak trees in particular here um, during the season, they really drop a lot of, of the uh, pollen into the pool. And so that's one of our regional problems is the trees around the pools in a lot of our areas here. And I like that, put the ball in their court, have the customer trim the trees or clean the trees. Oh, screen. absolutely. Yeah, you have to communicate, you have to tell them. And I would follow with an email, you know? Mm -hmm. So, hey, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so, you need to clean your screen enclosure because if you don't, this is what can happen. Then if they don't do anything about it, I've told them about it. This is their fault then when the rain comes and their pool turns green. You know, most likely it's not going to turn green because I'm going to have the water imbalance. But there's always that possibility mm -hmm. from this influx of, of organic schmutz that it could turn green on you and and by the you way your, your book sure. is full of those terms i was like what, is, what does this mean you know these different terms you're using in there so i have to start googling those words you know <laughs> there, um, there, there's nothing vulgar i promise yeah. uh, no. yeah, like i was mentioning to you before we started you know the book is just like you're in the room talking because you have all these kind of phrases put in there dropped in there i mean i really um, like the aspect of that that's really you know the book is written as a conversation. You know, I'm a pool guy. I consider myself to be a pool guy. I've been a pool guy my whole life. And I've written this book for pool guys and pool women, uh, the folks that are out there taking care of pool. And I don't necessarily mean that they have to have a service company, but anyone who takes care of swimming pools for a living, that's who I wrote this for. And it, it could even be beneficial for, um, there's some things in there homeowners shouldn't do, but it's, it, it, there's some good stuff in there for that as well to educate. But it's just a pool guy having a conversation with a pool guy or a pool guy having a conversation with a pool woman. That was the, the purpose behind the book. I didn't want to, I didn't, I didn't want to write this, this big thing textbook thing and i know it's in textbook format but what i really just wanted to do was to have conversations with folks on algae and i think that's what i've covered in the book so it's just me talking that's all but even yeah. um yeah so that that was the main goal behind it and i think you spent some time in the beginning well you spent quite a bit of time in the beginning talking about water balancing which in a way i think is of course it's critical with the whole issue of algae but what would be some of the key takeaways for the listener, you know, about balancing a pool water? And what does it actually mean to have a balanced pool? You know, that you hear that term all the time. You may not stop and think about what that actually means. Like I said, the book is on how to prevent and, or how to get rid of and how to prevent swimming pool algae. So it's not a book on algicides. It's A to Z. Like you said before, it starts with the environmental factors that could lead to algae. It starts with different types of algae you can expect to see from environmental factors, then to water balance and filtration. And I talk about those things, but only in how they pertain to either getting rid of or preventing algae, because I do stay on topic, I think, pretty well through throughout it. And there's, like I said, there's already plenty of other great books out there mm -hmm. on filter maintenance and things like that. So I didn't want to delve into that. But um, can you repeat that question? I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, the chemistry <laughs> part. What would be some, some key takeaways yeah. on the chemistry? Water balance. That's where we were. I'm so sorry. So water balance is not 
really anything to do with chlorine. And I guess that can be a common uh, thought for folks because when you think water balance, you know, we take our pool water sample to the pool store. We have the service guy, you know, come out and testing for chlorine is one of the things that they always test for. But what we're really looking at here is the saturation of calcium and carbonate in the water itself. And that's important because the water needs to have that calcium and car carbonate in that water so that way it doesn't try to draw it from elsewhere. If it's not saturated enough, it will pull it from elsewhere. And the nearest source of calcium for the water in the pool is where? Pool the itself. pool itself, right? The walls and the floor of the pool. So the pool can pull calcium and carbonate from the walls and floor of the pool. And when that happens, they call that etching. So what happens is, is it will start to cause the surface to deteriorate. So if you picture in your mind what the surface of an English muffin looks like with all those little nooks and crannies and such like that, that's what would be happening if we don't have enough calcium in the water. If we have too much calcium in the water, then it precipitates out and we end up with scaling. Doesn't lean as much toward an algae problem because scale isn't really porous, but we don't want that either. So we really want it to be in balance. And when we're in balance, it's when the values, when I'm talking about values, pH, carbonate alkalinity, not total alkalinity, pH, carbonate alkalinity, total dissolved solids, calcium hardness and water temperature are all in their happy place where they're all getting along the best they can, right? They were all in the spot where we're not and working together in different numbers where we're not gonna have things precipitate from the water and we're not gonna pull things from the pool. And those little nooks and crannies we spoke about that can happen from surface deterioration when we're looking at water balance create thousands of little dead spots in circulation, which allow algae to take a foothold. Yeah, that's that's a critical takeaway there, I think, for, for balancing the pool. And it's something that a lot of people don't think about. And I, I, I think about that because I have pools with the etching in there. And that's definitely a problem with algae. Um, and then also pools in my area, it's not uncommon to find a pool with a cyanuric acid level of 150 parts per million or higher. I mean, I, I think once it gets over 100, it's really hard to gauge exactly what is that. You have to be successful at doing a dilution test. You'd have yeah. to actually uh, do a 50-50 split with pool water. And then you could actually, for that, use tap water because there's not generally cyanuric acid in tap water and then take your reading and double it if you're able to get a reading at that time. But uh, it's not something that everybody's good at doing a dilution test. A high cyanuric acid at level can be problematic. One of the biggest areas that it is problematic is in water balance, like we spoke of, in that saturation index, because a lot of times folks don't take the cyanuric acid level into account when they're calculating what the saturation index is to determine whether or not the water is balanced. So we know that total alkalinity is the measurement of carbonates, bicarbonates, hydroxides, and cyanurates. So cyanuric acid is in there as well. But we don't want to use the cyanuric acid portion when we calculate water balance. We only want the carbonate alkalinity, which is the hydroxides, carbonates, and bicarbonates. So we actually have to remove the contribution of cyanuric acid from our total alkalinity to get the number we want. And the way we do that is we split the cyanuric acid level into thirds and we take one third from the total alkalinity. But when you start talking about high cyanuric acid levels, if we don't take that out, that could be a huge difference between being in balance and being extremely corrosive because the total alkalinity would drop substantially to the carbonate alkalinity, which is the number we really want. You with me on that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then also it makes, you know, I wouldn't say we talked about chlorine locking in a different podcast, but it makes it harder when the cyanuric acid level is really high for the chlorine to be effective against algae, it right? It slows down the effectiveness a lot. It definitely does. It, mm -hmm. it, um, you know, you can maintain the effectiveness of your chlorine with a high cyanuric acid level by having a higher level of chlorine in the water. But we need to make sure that we do that. As, I mean, if one goes up, the other has to go up. That's how that works. You can't just have the cyanuric acid level go up and maintain that same low level of chlorine that you've been using because then it's not going to be as effective 
as it was. Because cyanuric acid, it does slow down how chlorine works. And in the book, you know, we're going to touch on this in separate podcasts, but you talk about the different types of algae, green algae, mustard algae, white water mold, probably not an algae, right? Um, pink algae and black algae. And we're going to pack these in, in separate episodes. But um, just for the people listening right now, can you give us some things like some examples like, uh, for instance, in the book, you mentioned that the green algae is the most common, most easy to treat. How do I identify mustard algae? Things like that. Just some quick takeaways right there. Okay. Well, I'm not going to give away all my secrets because I do want people to buy the book. Yeah. <laughs> so I have to make sure that <laughs> so we have to make sure that there's stuff in there uh, that we don't chat about. But a green algae is the easiest to treat. It's also the easiest to recognize. If you walk up on a pool and it's green and the water is hazy, murky uh, along those lines, we know that we have a green algae problem. And usually an elevated chlorine level is all we need if we're catching it at the beginning stages of turning green. Now, if you have something like a foreclosed pool, which you know we also deal with from time to time where you need to do a green clean, and at those I kind of, I call it swamp vomit green because it is totally a different type of green than you get from your regular pools, then an elevated chlorine level is not gonna be enough. That's the easy thing to look at. And, and then what one of the things just in doing this at all that I would like to do is I would like to stop calling these an algae problem. I would like to stop looking at these as an algae problem. Instead, I would rather look at them like they're a symptom because that's how we really keep it out, right? So if we have algae in the pool, I wanna know why we have algae in the pool. Yes, I can kill the algae, but if I don't figure out why it's there, I'm probably gonna have to combat that algae again or add something along the lines of a preventative where I could have maybe easily done something else to keep it out. So I would like to, I mean, you almost have to be a little bit of a yeah. detective and put your detective hat on and think outside the pool and find what could be the issue. I mean, a lot of times it could be something that the homeowner is doing. Um, so we, we look for those things as well. Mustard algae, sometimes, there, you know, there's thousands and thousands of different types of diatoms. That's what mustard algae is. It's a diatom. That's the, uh, the family, that the class that it's in. It's, it's diatoms. And even, um, so if you think about it, the diatomaceous earth that we use, what that is is prehistoric mustard algae. So mustard algae, the diatoms, they have this cell wall that's made of silicate. They actually call it water glass. And that's what has managed to be preserved. It's not fossilized because nothing's actually gone through a change, but this cell wall, the shell, has been preserved through time. And in the desert areas, they're actually farming this, and that's where we get our diatomaceous earth from. Uh, but going back to mustard algae, you can have really tenacious strains where it adheres to the walls and it's near impossible to brush away. Or you can have the type that just sets on the floor like dust where you brush it and it goes up into a cloud and you don't see it again for two days. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you were referring to with the brush test we yeah. speak of. Because a lot of it can look like sand on the floor of the pool. So if you're not sure if it's sand or if it's mustard algae, just tap it lightly with a brush. If it dusts up and doesn't resettle out, then it was likely mustard algae. If you push it along and it settles back out right away, then it was most likely sand. And I think that's a good point for the listener that the algae problem is just a, a symptom of what's going on around the pool. I think if people are having black algae issues, for sure they got to buy this book because you spent a lot of time on black algae in here. And it's I a did. plague. It, uh, we use the term plague, and the black algae is definitely a plague in California. It's been called a lot of things. It's a plague, it has roots. They've said, you know, some people call it pool herpes. If you have to edit that out, that's fine, <laughs> because if you get rid of it, it always comes back. But I think it comes down to one. I mean, it, it comes down to really one or two different scenarios and how it gets established. I'm going to leave that in the book. So you're going to have yeah. to look that one up. Exactly. But I've done a lot with black algae back in 2018 when I first started this project of writing about algae. And not only did I notice there wasn't a book on algae available, there also wasn't any scientific information on black algae available. I mean, none in, as far as research goes on swimming pool black algae. 
And I had a lot of folks helping me look, a lot of scientists, and it was really challenging. And, and we really didn't come up with anything. So I decided that, you know, how hard can this be? Mm -hmm. I'll do it myself, do the research. So I got some vials and I reached out to some of my students, some of my peers, and asked if anybody had a pool with black algae. Luckily, one popped up in the town that I live in. Makes it nice and easy. Uh -huh. And I went over there and I collected samples. I added Lugol solution, which is an iodine solution to preserve it. And then I brought that over to the phycology department at the university here. And we put that underneath the microscope. And what we found in my black algae was that there was no, no algae in my black algae. Mm -hmm. So that was the first thing. Yeah. What we actually found was uh, three different... A genus of cyanobacteria. So what this actually was, this black algae that we look at, it's not an algae. What it actually is, it's a cyanobacterial biofilm. It's a biofilm with the main constituents being cyanobacteria. And of course, that slime that they produce, that being the biofilm itself, where other things can indeed take harbor. But uh, that, that was pretty interesting. And I went on throughout that whole summer running different experiments and, and and you know this we found uh pools from all across the southeast taking samples having them analyzed checking for toxicity um we found some that were nitrogen fixing which is super interesting because they can actually take atmospheric nitrogen from the air um, and convert it into something that they can use and then basically dumping ammonia you get you get the whole nitrogen cycle going on in the swimming pool and we've identified part of it it was really kind of an interesting project yeah i definitely recommend <laughs> they get the book to read about that because i found that fascinating um, because we deal with the black algae here no one's ever written about it in that aspect that you did in the book um so you know i appreciate the time you took on that black algae thing because it's one of the biggest problems in, in southern california and pools um, and you also, you know, you mentioned the classes you teach, CPO, and you have an algae prevention and er eradication specialist certification. I call it APSEC. <laughs> you can, you can use I, that you if know, you want. I want to say APSEC. We're, we're, we're going to let that not catch on. And <laughs> But it is it's an algae prevention and eradication specialist certification. I know it's long, but I wanted to call it what it is, and I wanted um, to set it up so that it could be a useful tool for the folks that go through the class. So there's the book, that's the first part of it. There's going to, there's a video tutorial, and then there's going to be an online test that follows that. And upon successful completion of the test, you get a passing grade, then you will get a certificate, a certificate from my company, Aquatic Facility Training and Consultants, signed by me, a certificate that you are now a certified algae prevention and eradication specialist. So not only do you gain the knowledge from the book and have that as a tool, you get, um, it looks like it's gonna be about a five hour online course with me. You get the knowledge from that because there are things in the video that are not in the book and there are things in the book that are not in the video. So I would definitely grab both components. And then what you end up with is a frameable certificate and I also send you a high resolution logo I don't know what you have over there or how well you can see it here, but it's up in the corner of the book. You can post a larger one, but you'll get a copy of that that you're able to use in your advertising, on your business card, on your website, on your social media, um, put it on your vehicle, I, you know, whatever you want to do with it. And that, I think, will help to give folks, a lot of folks, a marketable point of difference. And that's huge if you're trying to acquire clientele because you want to give the customer reasons to choose you reasons they want when they're looking at your website what they're thinking to themselves is help me decide to hire you mm -hmm. and they're looking for these point of difference things so they don't want to hear that you brush because we hope everybody brushes they don't want to hear that you skim that's swimming pool service that should be included anyway i don't want to know that you know what you're doing because everybody says they know what they're doing whether they do or they don't right? You've never called anybody in the world and said, why should I hire you? I have no idea what the heck I'm doing, right? People don't do that. They're going to say they know what they're doing. So it doesn't help make the decision. What they're, they're looking for are those points of difference, something that gives you added value. I mean, it can actually even justify you charging more. But if I'm a customer and I normally take care of my pool myself and I have an algae problem and I'm going to start searching around for somebody to help me, and then I come across this one company in this one area 
where they are certified algae prevention and eradication specialists, who do you think I'm going to call? I want the people who were trained on it. Not right? only that, Rudy, I think, you know, if you, someone has a green pool or an algae problem, and they see that you have that on your site, mm-hmm. you know, that's going to be a bonus for you as a pool pro trying to get those accounts. Absolutely. I mean, it's like almost like, you know, I, I picked up 30 accounts one summer um, with my truck with just a sign on there saying green pool cleanup specialist. That's all I had on the back window. I'm not kidding. I got so many accounts that summer for that. And I think people will see this on the website or on your truck and they'll call you because that's the number one problem I think they suffer with. Do-it-yourself homeowners just can't deal with algae. It's just a difficult thing. And it can be challenging if you don't yeah. know what to, how to tackle it. And the other thing that's often challenging is the advice that people are, are given um, or, you know, not, necess- from, not necessarily from, you know, service companies from friends from the yeah. internet because i know you know there's a lot of great content on the internet and i know you know this but there's also a lot of stuff out there that makes you scratch your head <laughs> and the homeowners they're trying to figure out which is which so what they end up with are you know cookie cutter instructions so i'm going to give you a solution that applies to every type of algae there is for your mustard algae problem there is no all in one that works great for all you follow yeah. So we need to identify what we have. We need to pick the best course of treatment for what we have. I mean, it goes back to treating the pool as an individual again. If you come in and to see me and I'm a doctor and you have, I don't know, a sore throat, I'm not going to give you a medicine that also treats for gas. I'd rather just give you the medicine for the sore throat because you don't have a gas problem, right? Yeah. Same thing in the pool. I just want to treat for the mustard algae if mustard algae is the problem you have. I want to treat for black algae if black algae is the problem you have. And the same thing when I go to prevent these after I eradicate them. I want to look and see if I can find the problem, fix the problem, get rid of the algae symptom. We'll call it the symptom. We'll get rid of the algae symptom. And then I need to prevent that if I couldn't fix the problem. And then if I want to prevent it with something that's designed specifically for preventing that type of algae. Not an all-in-one, because all-in-ones don't work that well. And the book is, is available on Amazon, and I'll definitely it have is. links I'll have links in the description here for the listeners that want to pick up a copy. And also, yeah, I'll, I'll link it to my website, and I'll link your websites there, too, for the book. Okay, um, you, fantastic. Yeah, if you want to stick around, we'll just touch on a few of the different algae types. We don't want to give too much away again in each yes, the, absolutely. thing, but we'll, we'll definitely go into each algae type. So I thank you for your time on this one. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. I think the easiest way to find the book for purchase is to go to Rudy's website, cpoclass.com. Again, that's cpoclass.com. And right from the homepage, you're going to see a little image of the book to the right. Click on that, and that'll take you to Amazon, and you can definitely purchase the book there. It's $29.99 currently at this recording, or $9.99 for the Kindle version. And I highly recommend the book. There's just so many great things in there that will help you with pools with algae. And we touched on a lot of this in these podcasts, but I think reading the book and having it as a reference definitely going forward is really a great way to become that expert on swimming pool algae. Also on his homepage, you're going to see a link to his algae prevention and eradication specialist certification course. Click on that also, and he's going to probably update it continuously on when the next online courses are. Um, But definitely you want to check out the algae course that he offers along with the book. I think they're both really great resources for you there. And if you're interested in the other episodes in this series that I recorded with Rudy, you can see those in the description of this podcast, or you go to my website, swimmingpoollearning.com, on the banner, click on the podcast show icon, and from there it'll take you to the hosting site, and you can scroll and click on whichever episode you want to listen to in this series on swimming pool algae. And if you're in the industry and you want to enhance your business, definitely consider my coaching program at poolguycoaching.com. A lot of great benefits for joining there, including a discount on your general liability insurance. And of course, if you're struggling with pools and algae, I can definitely help you with those. Again, you can learn more at PoolGuyCoaching.com. Thanks for listening to this podcast. Have a great rest of your week. God bless. Pool Service Pro. Open a Leslie's Wholesale account today and receive wholesale pricing on products you use every day. Leslie's Pool Supply offers convenient locations that are open seven days a week. Another great benefit of opening a Leslie's Wholesale account is Leslie's Referral Program. Get referred to a customer looking for weekly pool service. Save time and money and grow your pool service route and become a Leslie's Pro.